So this is going to be our discussion of the histology of the urinary system for biology 242. And I'm going to take my computer off of its, oh God, off of its little cradle here so I can draw on the screen. And I don't actually have any particular preference on which of these kidney slides you look at with the notable exception of uh, the fetal kidney. So like fetuses are not finished developing. So obviously like I can't really ask you a lot of questions on this thing. So although the fetal kidney is interesting to look at and compare to the adult kidney, um, other than that, don't look at it. So look at it if you're curious, I guess I'll say. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and pick the monkey kidney to start with, just because it has the most recognizable gross anatomy. So I can kind of give you a little tour of um, how to estimate what things are where, even when you are quite zoomed out. And we're waiting for this website to load. Progress. Good. Okay. I only have three applications open. I don't know why this is going so dang slow. Uh, but this. All right. So I'm going to close this. So what we have here is a trans section. So if you were to just basically cut me in half at the waist and pass through a kidney, this is about what you would see. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an orientation guide right now. And some of the terms that I use are not on your list. So if you're following along with your lab packet list, um, don't feel the need to add to it. If I say a word that's not on there, I'm just giving you a way to orient yourself to the slide and understand what you're seeing. I want to change color. Well, actually, this, this PP colored of yellow is actually sort of appropriate. So maybe I'll stick with it. Oh, no, it's frozen. There we go. So we're looking down on the kidney from above in a slice. And we're also able to see this area, which is the renal hilum. Wow, that's a terrible M. Let's try that again, Howard. Slash hillis. Uh, those two words, hilum and hillis, are interchangeable. It doesn't really matter what you say. Um, it's just the spot on an organ where all the tubes come and go. So the lungs have them. The kidneys have them. Um, there's one on the liver as well. It's not a term that's specific to the kidney. Um, so if you look closely, you can actually see uh, renal vasculature. So here's a blood vessel. Here's another one. Here's another one. Uh, not sure which they are at the moment. I would need to zoom in further and look. And then with regard to regions, I will make this little outline here. So I'm, I'm drawing an outline along a very obvious color difference. So hopefully you guys can see how the area that I've just outlined uh, is lighter in appearance as far as staining than the edge. So I have just outlined the renal medulla. So all this dark colored stuff at the edge here is cortex. And this lighter colored stuff down here is medulla. So cortex is where you will find most of what you need to know for the kidney. So So the reason I'm starting you off with this is because one thing that students do in the in-person labs a lot, because they don't know, and why would they? They're there to learn, is they'll get really frustrated and be like, I can't find any renal corpuscles, dang it. Or they'll keep trying to find a proximal or a distal convoluted tubule and not finding one. And that's because they've gone ahead and zoomed in on the medulla without bothering to start it for X magnification and scan around any. So, um, since I'm not asking you to identify nephron loop tubules or anything of the kind, just the medulla is a nice thing to be able to differentiate from the cortex, but don't zoom in here because there's nothing that you need to identify in there. 
So even if you're not very zoomed in, you can kind of faintly see a bunch of little circles. Oops, let's get another color here. So there's all these little circles here. So all these little circles in the cortex, these are your renal corpuscles. Um, and then the rest of the tissue is primarily proximal and distal convoluted tubule sections. So with that, let's zoom in on that area and what you need to know in there. So now I'm getting closer and you're starting to see those little circular areas pop out. Um, one common error that I see and you know, I don't expect to see this much with my current group of students because you guys are pretty savvy and on top of it. Um, but it is a mistake that's fairly common, so I want to warn you about it, and that is the following. Uh, students kind of connect in their mind the idea of circular balls of cells surrounded by non-circular things to the idea of the pancreas because of the pancreatic islets. So, a fairly a, a not insignificant portion of the time when students get renal corpuscle wrong the answer that they put instead is pancreatic islet so from that perspective not a bad idea to switch back and forth maybe have this open in one tab and the pancreas open in another tab and look at them side by side to make sure that you can tell which one you're looking at uh, reasonably confidently because I just want to help you avoid that error. Um, you know, it sucks when you lose points for something and then you go back later and you're like, oh, dang it, I totally knew that. Like, I know that feeling, it's not a good one, so I'm going to try and help you avoid that wherever possible. Okay. So I'm going to try and find... No, I guess it doesn't really matter, does it? Ooh. Sorry, this is just the sound of a, a dork getting unreasonably stoked about a renal corpuscle, so bear with me. Okay, I found one I like. But where did it go? There it is. Oh, jackpot. There's two good ones next to each other. Okay. So now I'm zooming in. So let's first, I'm gonna do some playing around and see which color pops out the best because I wanna make sure that whatever I draw you can actually see. Uh, that's decent. What about yellow? That's good, I like the yellow. Okay. So. This whole thing is renal corpuscle all of it so there is a glomerulus in there but the glomerulus isn't the only thing that is there so one thing i would like to make very clear is the idea that if I point to this structure, you need to be careful about the way that you read the question. Because um, if I point to the whole structure and say, just say identify the structure, then you need to go ahead and say renal corpuscle versus um, if I were to say identify the structure and then point at this clump of cells inside, let's make it a different color. That's the glomerulus. So if I pointed at that middle bit and I said, like, identify the specific capillaries or something, then you would say glomerulus. Because the glomerulus really only refers to the capillaries that are under pressure. The glomerulus does not also include the capsule around the glomerulus. The corpuscle does. So another way to say that would be I'm going to make like a little white space for myself to draw in or to write in rather. Be larger. There we go. So 
So I'm going to indent and say includes. the glomerulus, which is this thing, and then also the capsule, which has its own component parts. So the parietal layer you can pretty easily see because it's this edge group of squamous cells and then there's a space, which is Bowman space. The visceral layer are the cells that are covering over the glomerulus. So this is something that exists, but not something that I would ask you to identify histologically because you, because the visceral layer, the podocytes are on top of the glomerular capillaries, you can't visually distinguish between them on this particular stain and slide. So renal corpuscle, that's what you're looking at here. And if I zoom out a little bit, so let's trash that. You can see that they are all over the place. So all of these little guys that I'm circling are renal corpuscles. You only see renal corpuscles in the cortex. So if you see these, you know that you're in the renal cortex. That's pretty easy. Okay, so now let's look at tubes. So in the cortex, you have two kinds of tubes to worry about, and those are proximal and distal convoluted tubules. So let's zoom in and find some. What I'm hoping to do is navigate to a place where are, there are both kinds and they are right next to each other because it's always easier to learn this distinction if you can compare and contrast the two right next to each other. Because really, when you distinguish between proximal and distal convoluted tubules, what you're doing is visually distinguishing between two different kinds of simple cuboidal epithelium. So in 241, we start you off by saying, hey, learn to identify simple cuboidal epithelium. And now the training wheels are off. And now I'm saying, hey, there are different flavors of cuboidal epithelium and you need to know the difference between them, which seems like a big ask, but I will show you how to do it with confidence so that you're not worried about it by the time we get to the practical. Fortunately, on histology guide slides, it's pretty easy. Um, it's not this easy on all of our in-person slides, so this is one of those times when uh, you got a little one-up from online learning here. So I'm going to start with PCT. So I'm going to circle some, and then I'm going to explain why I chose the ones I did. Ooh, here's a nice little wormy shaped one. It's like, it looks like an inchworm. Whee. Okay, so these are all proximal convoluted tubules. I want to... Make myself a little space to write here. Okay. Oh, good question. Uh, no, the Bowman's capsule is not the same as the renal corpuscle. It's part of the renal corpuscle. The renal corpuscle includes both the glomerulus and the capsule. So two things. So the PCTs that I've circled here uh, are the tubes that are circled in yellow. So you're seeing uh, they are eosinophilic. Uh, and that's a word that in histology means they like to pick up the eosin stain. So this stain is hematoxylin and eosin. Eosinophilic things uh, are bright pinkish orange. So PCTs are this. And 
because they have microvilli at the apical surface, they have a brush border. And let me point at it. And that creates the appearance of a fuzzy occluded lumen. So you can see that there's a lumen there, but if you look at it, you can see that like the edges of the lumen are kind of irregular. And in some cases it looks like almost filled in because of this brush border. That's classic to the PCT. So a case where you almost can't see the lumen of the tube at all is really common for PCTs and it's one of the things you should be looking for for distinguishing them. So those are the hallmarks of the proximal convoluted tubules. So let's find some distals. And remember, I picked this particular area because there were proximals and distals right next to each other, which means that you have a really nice opportunity to look at them side by side and visually assess how they are different, which is the best way to learn this stuff. So let's do that, shall we? So I've circled some distal convoluted tubules. So let me make myself a little spot to write again. Okay, so these are DCTs. which stands for distal convoluted tubule. Um, you are responsible for knowing the full term distal convoluted tubule and spelling it out if asked. One thing that I've been noticing as I make my way through the practicals as far as spot checking them for stuff that Canvas missed is um, I try to be very explicit in the question uh, where it'll say something like, identify the structure circled in yellow, two words do not abbreviate or something like that. So two words is me giving you a hint that your answer is not just one word or not three words. And the do not abbreviate is me telling you, you'll get it wrong if you abbreviate. So uh, I know that testing anxiety can get in the way of following instructions. I totally get that. But um, you know, when I write that stuff, that's me trying to get you to the right answer. So you maximize your likelihood of success if you follow those instructions. So if I say abbreviate, then it's okay, go ahead. If I say don't abbreviate, then don't. Otherwise, Canvas is gonna mark you wrong. Okay, so DCTs, also cuboidal, but they are less eosinophilic. No brush border which leads to cleaner apical surface for the epithelium and more obvious lumen. So take a moment to look at those and also compare them to the proximal convoluted tubules nearby. And I think you'll notice the differences almost right away. So, All of the ones I just circled in yellow are PCTs. And all of the ones I'm circling in blue are distal or DCTs. 
So hopefully the difference between those is pretty clear and you can practice with it as well. Okay, so that is the stuff you need to know for the kidney. You also need to know the urinary bladder. So let's go find the bladder. Oopsie, I went back too far. There we go. So this is the bladder and it's the whole thing, which is nice. So you can see that the muscularis is really thick on this thing. And then this layer is the submucosa. And the mucosa is urothelium, which is to say transitional epithelium. So this structure serves two purposes. One is to store urine and the other is to void it. So the muscularis is collectively named the detrusor or the detrusor muscle because of its very specific urinary based function. Likewise, transitional epithelium is also called urothelium because it is specific to the urinary system. Um, so where you see spaces that contain urine is where you would expect to see urothelium. So let's go have a look. Oh, so before I go too far in, one thing that you'll notice is that because this is a relaxed bladder, not full, um, the lumen is not round. So we have this very um, sort of, oops, there we go, lumen with lots of points to it and lots of sort of inlets and whatnot. So this shape we call a stellate lumen. Uh, stellate meaning star-like. Uh, so obviously not really very star-shaped, but you get the idea close enough. Um, but because this tissue is supposed to be elastic and it expands and fills with urine and contracts many times per day, when it is relaxed, uh, the lumen is a wrinkly shape because it's there to be able to accommodate expansion because it's a stretchy tissue. So that's why the lumen is shaped like that. And that's also a luminal shape that is more or less specific to the urinary system. So you see it in the urethra, you see it in the bladder. So let's zoom in on this part and I will show you transitional epithelium. So the transitional epithelium slash urothelium is from there to there. And this is the one that beginner students most frequently confuse with stratified squamous epithelium. But if you look at the cells at the apical surface, which I'm going to change my color here, you'll notice that they're not flat. They're domed. Um, because of this domed shape, they're also in some sources called umbrella cells. So if you see that term, just know that it means these top cells. And you can actually see that if you look carefully, there's a little dividing line between these cells and the ones below them. So we call this a scalloped edge. That's what the name of that is. Um, and that's again, because this is relaxed transitional epithelium. So it's, it's relaxed, it's bunched up and these cells are capable of being stretched but are not currently being stretched. So transitional epithelium serves two purposes. One is 
to be stretchy. And I suddenly can't spell stretchy. The other is a little bit less obvious from its shape, but uh, you can tell by the density of the urothelium. And that is to be resistant to low pH. So, And that's because the urine is often considerably more acidic than the body because of the proximal and distal convoluted tubules role in scrubbing acid out of the blood. Um, so if you wanna design a place where some acidic fluid is gonna sit, it makes sense to have that fluid uh, basically sort of held away from sensitive tissues. So um, transitional epithelium is extra resilient in the face of acid as well. So there's basically two locations where there's a muscular bag that contains acidic stuff. The first one that you learned about is the stomach, um, which is a lot more acidic than the urine, but the second one is here, the bladder. So we've got this specialized urothelium that's resistant to acid because a lot of times pee is pretty acidic compared to your body fluids. So that concludes what you need to know about the urinary system. So. Uh, we did ureter uh, a while ago when we looked at transitional epithelium the first time, and now we have bladder, and then you don't need to know the medullary tubes in the kidney. So that is it for urinary histology for this term. Any questions before we finish with this stuff?